Hi, uh, my name is Anna Yurick Duggins, and I am an elder law attorney. And I have with me today Denise Amadon, who is an elder law paralegal. And we work as a team with our clients. And the subject that I want to talk to you a little bit about today is Medicaid planning. And we do, just so you know, to start off, I'm going to go through some of the things we have in this Medicaid planning brochure. This is available on our website, so you can download it or read it at your convenience, and um, you'll have all that information for you there, uh, but I'm going to talk about it now as well. One of the first questions we get when we do Medicaid planning for people is, what does Medicaid pay for? And Medicaid will pay for nursing home care, and it will pay for the PACE program, which is uh, at Tanglewood Park here in Muskegon. Those are the two programs that it primarily will cover. It does not cover assisted living facilities for the most part. There are rare exceptions to that, but for purposes, uh, if, if you have someone in an assisted living facility and you're wondering if Medicaid will pay for their care, you can give us a call and we can talk to you about that. But for purposes of this video, we're primarily talking about the PACE program or nursing home. We're not talking about assisted living. In the event that you have a loved one who needs Medicaid, the first thing that people want to know are what assets can we keep and still become Medicaid eligible. I know people are, are very scared of nursing home costs, and frankly, I, I don't blame them. I mean, nursing home costs are on average $6,500 a month, and people are worried that they're not going to have anything to take care of themselves if they're a stay-at-home spouse and it's their, their, their husband or wife that they're putting into the facility. They're wondering, well, how am I going to have enough to pay for my house or my food and, and everything that I need and pay $6,500 a month. It's very frightening. I'm going to go over the things that you can keep and then additional assets that we can help you keep as well. There are certain assets that a, a single person and a married person both can retain. And those are called your exempt assets. And they are your home, you can have one vehicle, you can have a life insurance policy with a face value of $1,500 or less, you can have a prepaid irrevocable funeral contract, you can have all of your personal belongings, and then you can have $2,000 or less. Did I miss anything, Denise? No, I think you covered it all, Anna. Okay, so those, those are your exempt assets. And I think a lot of people are fairly familiar with those exempt assets and have, a, have an idea of what those are. It's these other things that I'm going to talk about right now that are, uh, I, unfortunately, a lot of people aren't aware that you can keep other assets in addition to those exempt assets that we just went over. So, and before I get into that a little bit, you need to know that there are differences for people who are single versus people who are married. I'm going to talk about married people first. And for married people, there's great news. We can keep 100% of your assets and you can become Medicaid eligible. And I know that's hard for a lot of people to believe. They think that they have to spend down to a certain amount or they've heard that their friend or their neighbor, that this happened to them and they had to, to spend all of their assets or to a certain amount before they could become Medicaid eligible. But it is true, you can keep everything if you're married and become Medicaid eligible. I've had people who have paid privately for years before they've come in to see me. And I had one woman who actually, she started to cry because she had spent, I think it was like $180,000 of her own money before she actually found out that she could become Medicaid eligible and she could have saved all of those assets. And it's really unfortunate. So I try to get the word out to as many people as I can that you can keep all of your assets and become Medicaid eligible if you're married. And the reason for that is that the laws in Michigan are very favorable towards a stay-at-home spouse. And the stay-at-home spouse is the person who is not going into the nursing home. They don't necessarily have to be in the home. They can be in an assisted living facility uh, or independent living, or they can be in the residence, but they cannot also be in the nursing home. So in addition to those exempt assets, the, the laws of Michigan say that the stay-at-home spouse can keep one half of the other assets that are the non-exempt assets or $109,560, whichever is less. So if you have $300,000, they allow you to keep $109,560. If you have $100,000 of other assets, they allow you to keep $50,000. And those assets can, can be anything. So we're, they don't necessarily have to be uh, money in a bank which that would work too, but it could be a second vehicle, it could be a piece of real estate, it can be stocks, bonds, any type of an asset that you might own would be considered something that could make up this 109,560 or one half of the balance of the assets. 
So how do we keep the, the whatever's left over? So in that example of the, the um, $100,000, I say you can keep 50000 as a stay-at-home spouse. What do we do with the other 50000 Well, you can create what's called a solely for the benefit of trust, and we prepare these for people. They're irrevocable trusts that are for the benefit of the stay-at-home spouse. They, the stay-at-home spouse cannot be a trustee. We have to have somebody independent be a trustee. It can be a son or a daughter. Uh, it can be both uh, more than one child. It can be a trusted friend, but it, it cannot be the stay-at-home spouse. And the solely for the benefit of trust is required to pay out for the life expectancy of that stay-at-home spouse. So. So with respect to the divisor, for example, if you're 90, if you're, if you're 90 years old, you might have a life expectancy of 4.4 years. And the, you know, I know these are things that we don't like to think about, but DHS is the Department of Health and Human Services that governs Medicaid. They've thought about life expectancies and they've come up with a, a, a chart that tells us for each age what a person's um, life expectancy is. And we have to go by that chart that DHS has provided us with and we calculate then every year how much you will receive as a distribution from the solely for the benefit of trust. If you live for your entire life expectancy, then the entire amount of the trust will be distributed back to you. Every year when we make the distribution, we do have to notify DHS that the distribution has been made. We do the calculations for the distribution because they're a little bit complicated. Uh, so we make sure to do that for you so that you don't have to worry about whether or not you've made the right calculation or not. But the great thing is, when you utilize one of these trusts, is that you can keep 100% of your assets. And we do this for people on a regular basis. Uh, sometimes they have as, as little, uh, you know, there's no set amount that you have to have in order to create the trust, it's just if it's necessary. So we have some people that maybe only have a $20,000 piece of real estate that they wouldn't otherwise be able to keep if we weren't able to do the trust. We have other people that have several hundreds of thousands of dollars that we put into the trust and they're able to keep all of those assets and still become Medicaid eligible. So it's a very effective tool and we do it all the time for our clients. So that's the, the good news for married people. Unfortunately, for single people, we can't do as well as what we do for married people, but there, we can do more than just keeping the exempt assets. With married people, we can keep about one half of the other assets that you have in addition to the exempt assets. And I say about because, again, there's a, a complicated calculation that needs to be run to determine how much you can gift away versus how much you keep and use to pay for the nursing home. In Michigan, they, uh, there's a five-year look-back period. And what that means is that, is that if you've given anything away over the last five years, they include that in your assets for purposes of determining whether or not you're Medicaid eligible. If you have given things away, you can still file an application, but they'll say you're approved, but because you made this gift, Medicaid isn't gonna cover for a certain number of months. And after that certain number of months has expired, then Medicaid will start to pay for your nursing home care. And so because these, uh, these rules, we, are allowed, we can gift away some of the assets, which will incur a penalty, and we purchase what's called a Medicaid-compliant short-term annuity. And that annuity will pay out a monthly fee that together with your pension and Social Security is the amount that needs to be paid to the nursing home during that penalty period. So if you make a gift and you're penalized for nine months, then you're going to have an annuity that runs for nine months, and that annuity together with your other income will be what needs to be paid to the nursing home. In the event that you were to, to die or that the person in the nursing home were to die before the annuity had run the penalty period, this, the primary beneficiary for the annuity needs to be the state of Michigan to the extent that the state of Michigan has covered your nursing home care. That's one of, the, one of the requirements in order for this to be a Medicaid compliant annuity is that the state of Michigan has to be the primary beneficiary. But it's only to the extent that they've covered your nursing home care. And during this penalty period, you are private paying and the state of Michigan is not covering your nursing home care. So during the penalty period, um, since you're private paying, if you were to die before the annuity paid in full, the secondary beneficiary can be your children or to whomever you'd like your assets to be distributed. And we have had a few clients that have, have died before the penalty period expired and those annuities went straight to whomever their beneficiaries were that they designated on, on as a contingent beneficiary on the annuity. 
So it's really a low risk situation um, in the event that you don't live for the entire penalty period. Um, the assets still get to your to your loved ones, and so it's it's kind of a win-win situation. Most people, again, aren't aware that you can save any assets when you're single, and they think that they just need debt to spend down to the two thousand dollars or put home improvements in their house, which is also something that we look at. You know, the, one of the first things that we do is we say, well, what does the person in the nursing home need? So before we before we do a gift and annuity, we want to make sure that those people are set up with anything and everything that they might need. So if they need dental care or if they need um, a new television set or if they need new clothing, whatever it might be that they need at the nursing home to keep them comfortable, we want them to have it. Then, And we also make sure they have a prepaid funeral, which is um, important if they're single. Then we, we say, well, if they have a piece of real estate, is there anything that we can invest in that real estate that would um, increase the value of that real estate on resale? And we have to be careful here in Muskegon because the economy hasn't been the best and re real estate isn't selling the best. Um, but there sometimes are some cosmetic things that will go a long way to increase the value of maybe a fresh coat of paint. Perhaps there needs to be a new roof or a new furnace. And so we'll look at those things and identify if there are, are any ways that we can improve the real estate. And only after those things are done do we do the gift and annuity split. Now, with both a married couple and with a single person, it's important to know that Medicaid doesn't always cover 100% of the nursing home stay. There's something that's called a patient pay amount. And a patient pay amount is the amount that you have to pay on a monthly basis. For a single person, it's pretty easy to calculate the patient pay. It's your monthly income, less $60 for what they call a personal needs allowance, less any amount that you need to pay for your supplemental care insurance. So that would be like a Humana or Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Priority Health, anything where you're paying out of pocket on a monthly or quarterly basis, you will, uh, you're able to retain those funds in order to make those premium payments. You're still gonna keep your supplemental health insurance um, generally when you uh, apply for Medicaid. If you're a married couple, sometimes you do have a patient pay and there is a, a calculation that goes along with it, so it's not easy for me to give you an example, but uh, a lot of times our, our clients don't have any patient pay when they're married. Depending on what their income is, though, and what their living expenses are, sometimes they can be several hundreds of dollars, and we've had a couple of them that are even in the thousands of dollars. But what we'll do is we'll run that, that figure for you so that you know uh, an approximate of what the patient pay will be so that you can do some planning and decide whether or not Medicaid is the right option for you. When we do the applications for people, whether they're for single people or for married people, we really do try to take the burden off of you and we give you a checklist that gives you a list of everything that you need to compile. We have you sign a release that gives Denise the ability to talk to financial institutions and any uh, hospitals or um, nursing home facilities so that we can compile information that might not be easy for you to compile it yourself so that you can go through this process with as much ease as possible. Uh, we understand that when you're caring for a loved one and you're making this transition, it's difficult and we really do wanna help out in any way that we can. So that gives you a little overview of what we can do for you to help you preserve assets and still become Medicaid eligible. Again, this information is available on our website so you can read it in more detail. But either Denise or I are happy to answer any questions that you might have. And if you'd like to schedule an appointment, we would be happy to do that.